Okay, everyone. Um, so I've let everyone in that I need to. I'm just going to change my view. And then um, I'd like to welcome you all to uh, our talk tonight from Dr. Mary McAuliffe, who is a lecturer and assistant professor in gender studies at UCD, specializing in um, Irish women's and also gender history. She completed her BA, MA and PhD in Trinity College Dublin. So um, a real Dubliner now, even though she's a Kerry woman originally from just outside where I'm from. And uh, she's Dubliner. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Her most recent publication was a biography of the feminist, trade union activist and revolutionary Margaret Skinner. And for a long time, she was president of the Women's History Association of Ireland. She still serves on that committee and they've just had a, a hugely successful march where they had a conference for the month. Um, she is also a member of the National Archives of Ireland Advisory Council and on the Irish Association of Prof Professional Historians. She's a past president of the Women's History Association of Ireland. So, um, she uh, there was a fantastic documentary i think i mentioned it last year when it was on first Koga ermano or the war on women um actually it was kind of maybe just before christmas i think that i saw that on tina g it was about the violence done to women during the war of independence and afterwards in the civil war too so she was a a major um kind of contributor uh, to that as well so we're delighted to have mary with us um i'm always delighted of course to have a carry woman on and i'll um, Barbara, are we recording it? No, we don't really record them, but they're live on Facebook and Facebook records it. So like you can kind of archive it there and I, I yeah, so it'll be archived on Facebook. Um, so the topic tonight is, you're welcome, is uh, having no use for men at all, which, you know, I don't know, <laughs> would we all agree with that or not? Sometimes they come in a little bit handy, but she's going to discuss um, same sex relationships with women, uh, Irish revolutionaries and women's suffrage movement um, activists. Earlier this month, we had a look at the Irish American angle from Dr. Tara McCarthy up in Wisconsin. So, um, but a different group in a different time period. So I think this will be very interesting. It's kind of a new one for us. So I'm delighted to pass it over to you and I'll share my screen now so you can see the slide. Share the screen now. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I have some Irish, Irish American content as well. Oh, great. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm just going to minimize the screen so that it's only the speaker that could be on. Okay. And I wonder if you, if you could take me out of full view so I can see my paper. Can you see that now? Oh, that's me myself. Exit full screen. Yes, that's okay. it. That's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, sorry. Um, to, to speak here tonight. Um, are we on the, oh yes, I can see where we are now. <laughs> Even after a year of using Zoom, I still get confused. I um, it, it's great to, to be here with you at midnight, my time, but uh, I'm delighted to share this research I've been doing. And I'm doing sort of a, a, a double pronged research um, for the rest of the decade of centenaries. Um, uh, Elizabeth mentioned the, the violence against women. Uh, that's my other project that I'm doing. It's the uh, sexual and gendered violence against women during the War of Independence and Civil War, mainly the forcible hair cutting. Uh, but as I was doing the research, I also came across a uh, mention of um, a number of relationships between women um, among the leadership of the suffrage and revolutionary women. Uh, and Roy Foster, for example, mentions it in his book, Vivid Faces, which came out there a couple of years ago. Um, and so I thought I'd follow on that thread and it has turned into a very rich um, part of the research I'm doing. So to explain the title of my talk, having no use for at all for men, in her diary and uh, writer, suffrage and Republican activist, Rosamund Jacob, uh, a Waterford woman, uh, Quaker and revolutionary and suffrage woman, noted that neither of her friends, fellow suffrage and Republican activists, Kathleen Lynn and Madeleine French Mullen, Dr. Kathleen Lynn, of course, both of whom fought as members of the Irish Citizen Army in 1916 and who lived together in Rathmines, uh, um, just outside the city centre for many years, had, that had any use for men at all. And that's where that, that phrase comes from. It's what Rosamond writes in her diary about them. She goes on to describe a domestic scene uh, of the two women who, when she called to see them, were breakfasting in their bed, as was their custom. 
Their relationship, which Roy Foster in Vivid Faces says had all the hallmarks of a marriage, lasted 30 years, from when the women met during the 1913 lockout to Madeleine's death in 1944. And if you go on to the next slide, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. This is the two of them. This is Dr. Kathleen Lynn and Madeleine French Mullen, and I'll talk a little bit more about them later on. During all this time, the, the couple lived together, shared a life together, were activists together, and in their diaries leave very broad hints of an intimate partnership. Lynn and French Mullen are relatively well-known historical figures are in, and are included in most revolutionary gendered and medical history because, of course, Dr. Kathleen Lynn was the founder of St. Dalton's Hospital for Six Infants in 1919, and that remained uh, a hospital in Dublin through most of the 20th century. Yet their partnership is, often, is most often written of in terms of their political and social activism and not their obvious intimate personal relationship. So despite 40 years of dedicated and rigorous scholarship and revolutionary and suffrage women in Ireland, there are still histories that are silent, histories that are invisible. And it is these, so these queer histories, in particular these queer female histories, that I want to talk to you about this evening. And this has been a very interesting part of it. In a way, these silent histories or these hidden histories cannot be said to have been written out of history as they were never actually thought of in the first place or not looked for or not included. We can ask some questions. Were there same-sex female partnerships prominent in the overlapping feminist, socialist, trade union and Republican circles whose sexuality has remained largely hidden from history? We do know of the histories of some of the men in the revolutionary movement whose sexuality was openly homosexual, the most famous, of course, being Roger Casement, who despite leaving a diary detailing his sexual encounters with young men, uh, there are still some who question his sexuality to, the, to this day. In the case of women, it's much harder to unpack their private lives, as women are generally harder to find in history, uh, and lesbian women even more so. So we have to ask these questions of what, uh, how do we find them? So from the 1980s onwards, the historiography of the women and rising is one of constant recovery, rewriting uh, and, and reanalyzing their contributions and who they were. Over 40 years of research and writing on women in the revolutionary era, mainly by women historians, has led to a real richness, richness of scholarship. But even with this gender and feminist scholarship, the exclusion, sometimes deliberate, and I'll talk about that in a few minutes, of the histories of women who choose to spend their lives with women is evident. As Judith Butler uh, Bennett has noted in History Matters, Western culture's long-standing willingness to disbelieve in female same-sex love is alive and well in women's history, uh, for which queer history remains a tricky subject and sometimes an unspeakable one. Further writings on queer histories and cultures, language and definitions come from, among others, Joan, Joan Scott, Joan Nessel, Adrienne Rich, who helped define, complicate and elaborate the difficulties of historicizing the queer subject or definitely or and of defining what it means to be a lesbian, for example. Can we use those terms? What sort of language do we use? How do we find uh, these women in the archives? Uh, and so we have to understand that women's lives are very, very important. Much research has concentrated on the concept of the romantic friendships between women, of homosocial groups. And this is uh, very interesting because if you go on to the next slide uh, there, um, Elizabeth, an awful lot of these women, and this is a photograph taken in 1916 of 66 of the women who were involved in the Easter Rising out of 300. And of the 66 women here, there are at least four couples, uh, who are same-sex couples here. But how do we decide how these, they, these are couples and not uh, romantic friendships or homosocial groups? Because, of course, the, the um, women at the time in the early 20th century spent most of their time together. And you could say, for example, Hannah Shee Skeffington, who was married and had a child and definitely uh, wasn't involved in any um, lesbian relationships, but spent most of her time with women. So she was involved in homosocial groups. Um, so how do we separate out that? Couple in, couples in Ireland who fit this historicizing of uh, romantic friendships, including the 18th century couple, the ladies of Langollen, 
um, who ran away together and lived in Wales for many years. And in the 19th century, couples such as Somerville and Ross, as Carl Smith Rosenberg remarked in her study of um, uh, female, uh, the female world of love and ritual in 19th century American, America, at one end of the continuum lies committed heterosexuality, and at the other end, uncompromising homosexuality, with a wild latitude of emotions and sexual feelings in between. However, the studies of these presumed, uh, these uh, homosocial relationships presumed asexuality, uh, and often um, eluded the, the, the desire between women. Interestingly, in more recent times, historian Helena Whitbread has untangled the code in which Anne Lister wrote her diaries, giving us the life and world of a learned 19th century Northern English aristocratic women devoted to the pursuit of love of the love of other women. The diaries reveal as um, a world that is structured less by romantic friendships and a shared refusal of pa patriarchy and more by desires, sexual and gender roles. Uh, and a total rejection of sexual sameness. So into the 21st century, however, as Sue Morgan has written, there is an increased dissatisfaction of, of lesbian history based on the language of self-identification of coming out stories. Knowing from for sure, do we have to know for sure? What is the level, what is the standard of proof? And we have to question all of this. Do we have to um, believe that these women um, were having sex basically is that the standard of proof where we don't need that in heterosexual relationships um so understanding that lesbian history is not separate or isolated from within women's histories that questions of family marriage childbearing rearing class politics revolution radical politics means that feminist historians need also to consider the ways in which lesbian sexuality intersected with the lived categories outside of sexuality and gender so it's the fact that women who were involved in same-sex relationships were also um, were women helps to make them invisible in the histories. Even with these radical women, the ones I'm going to be talking about, their public lives are not easily researched, their private lives, sorry, are not easily researched or written. More recently, there has been an opening up of studies on women's sexual agency outside of the norm, more generally. Uh, Leanne Lane, has her biography of Rosamond Jacob, whom I mentioned in the beginning, she was a woman who, although she never marries, uh, and she never did stop longing, as Lane says, to find love, companionship and marriage, writes in her diaries about uh, a sexual relationship outside of marriage that she had with Frank Ryan, uh, the revolutionary. And this was a very radical choice because, of course, an unmarried woman having a sexual relationship outside of marriage with the possibility of pregnancy in the early 20th century in Ireland was very dangerous for her. Uh, it would certainly have ruined her reputation had it been found out. So sources like this, like Jacob's diary, show us that there are spaces, invisible secret spaces, dangerous spaces, in which women could have sexual agency and sexual relationships outside of the marital, the domestic and the procreative, which was the only acceptable way for women. So in thinking of that, and it is in these spaces opened up by radicalism and revolutionary politics that I want to look for the women that I wish to talk about in this paper. So tracing these activists, friendship and kinship networks of suffrage and nationalist women of early 20th century Ireland is an integral part of political and revolutionary histories. Writing women into these spaces can be fraught with difficulty. Uh, it is a task in which we have to deconstruct uh, systems of power and gender and how it operates and challenges do uh, dominant social formations of femininity and masculinity. So looking back to Roy Foster and his world that he wrote about in Vivid Faces, this was an um, early 20th century revolutionary and radical world dominated by student society, theatre groups, feminist collectives, volunteer militias, Irish language groups, linked together by youth, radicalism, subversive activ activism, enthusiasm and love. However, even in Vivid Faces, it is a world where men are to the forefront and where women exist in it, it's because they're part of or invited into that world. 
While the world Foster evokes as one dominated by youthful romantic heterosexual passions, and this was quite radical at the time as well because young men and women were choosing to fall in love with each other rather than, you know, have made matches or have their parents involved in their relationships and deciding who they were um, going to marry. And there's also some class cross class uh, love affairs. And indeed, that was part of the um, series that was put on in 2016. You have a trade union man and a middle class woman falling in love. And that was quite radical at that time. Um, but there is no doubt, as with the British first wave feminist histories of Sapphists and suffragettes, that there were spaces here for women to make their lives political and personal with other women. In the early 20th century, women of the new generation, many of whom had come to feminism, socialism and militant nationalism in the first decade, not only chose radical politics, they also chose radical lives. And it is this group of urban dwelling radical activists, feminists, among whom there were a cohort to all who chose to make their lives with each other that I want to introduce to you this evening. In particular, I'm going to look at four couples. I, in the, in the, the uh, piece I'm writing up on this, I have uh, about a dozen couples, but I want to concentrate on, on four or five of them for you this evening. And I think they're, they're pretty famous ones and ones that you would know. So one of the big problems with writing these histories, like writing histories of any women, is finding source material. Archival and interview materials are subjective and allow us only initially explore the centrality of economic independence, higher education, and the capacity to be involved in revolutionary movements of many of these middle-class women. So how then do you find their, their personal stories, their hidden histories, some of whom who hid, hid them deliberately, some of whom their executors or their descendants hid their, their personal lives. However, there are ways of going about this and of finding them. And I want to talk about uh, a couple of them. And the first are Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan. And the next slide um, there, Elizabeth. Next slide, please. Elizabeth and yeah, Julia. There. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Elizabeth and Julia, yes. So Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan uh, were born in city centre in Dublin, uh, both from working class backgrounds. Uh, of course, Elizabeth would be very famous as Nurse O'Farrell, the woman who brought out the surrender flag in 1916 and then walked with Pierce to make the official surrender uh, at that time. Um, and she's often talked about as a nurse, but actually, interestingly, she wasn't a nurse in 1916. She didn't train to become a nurse until the early 1920s. She also wasn't a girl, and she's often talked about, uh, as Joe Good wrote in his memoir of his time in the GPO in 1916, a very pretty and pale girl. She wasn't. She was in her 30s, as was Julia at this time. And by 1916, they had over 15 years of radical feminist suffrage and trade union activism behind them. Um, and as she left the GPO, the GHQ on Moore Street in 1916 to deliver the surrender to the British, she leaves Julia behind her with the remaining garrison. And there we know that the wounded James Connolly, who at this stage is, is dying because he's got gangrene in his wound, tries to soothe the anxious Julia, reassuring her that her Elizabeth would be fine. So you see here some hints that there is recognition by their comrades that there is a special relationship between Elizabeth and Julia. It isn't just uh, comrades. It, they, they are uh, each other's special somebody. Um, they lived together for many years in 27 Lower Mount Street until Elizabeth died first. They remained together for decades after 1916 uh, and upon their deaths were buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. So next slide, I want to explain how I uncovered their particular relationship. Uh, as I said, Julia and Elizabeth lived together for many, many years. Um, sorry, I'm going to have to... So, uh, next slide, sorry. Um, it has moved on, I think it's just, you're not seeing it. Oh no, the next one after that. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, I had always thought that uh, Elizabeth and Julia had a homosocial relationship, that they lived together, maybe they were friends, they didn't get married, they were devoted to their politics. However, when you look into the detail, particularly after Elizabeth died, you begin to see a more intimate relationship. 
and particularly in their death notices. And this is what I mean by the archives. Sometimes you have to come at the archives from a, um, a sideways viewpoint. There are no archives that are going to tell me that Elizabeth and Julia Grennan were a couple. So I have to read the archives uh, in order to understand their relationship. And when Elizabeth O'Farrell died in 1957, the death notice that appeared in the newspapers uh, in Ireland said, O'Farrell, Nurse Elizabeth, the relatives and lifelong partner of the late nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell, 27 Lower Mount Street. The lifelong partner, of course, is Julia Grennan. And then further on at the funeral, when the funeral was reported, the chief mourners were Miss Sheila or Julia Grennan, and then Miss Messrs Patrick Collum and Brendan White. Sheila is in the place where you would have a widower, or had Elizabeth being a man, a widow. And uh, Patrick, Colum and Brendan are actually Elizabeth's nearest blood relatives. They are the sons of her uh, sister Bridget, her only sister Bridget, but they don't get first billing, so to sp speak, in this because um, Elizabeth has a lifelong partner. And this is very unusual. Uh, generally, you don't get this. So here is recognition of the uh, relationship of Elizabeth and Julia in the death notice. And the next slide, please. And it continues after that. Sorry, the next, oh yeah, there. Um, Elizabeth was buried in Glasnevin Cemetery. Uh, she was buried in a grave that was further away from the, um, if you go back again, sorry. She was buried in, in a grave further away from the Republican plot. Um, the Republican plot contains the, the dead of the 1916 Rising, including Camps Markovich and indeed Margaret Skinner, who I'll be talking about later, and then the other Republican men. About two years after Elizabeth was uh, had died and was buried, Julia brought, bought a plot right beside the Republican plot, had Elizabeth exhumed and moved to that new plot, um, a new uh, a beautiful headstone was put over Elizabeth with, you know, you can see there Elizabeth O'Farrell, Easter Week 1916, a poem by Brian O'Higgins, and then a space underneath for where Julia's name would go in when she died. So here you have evidence of the intensity of that connection between Elizabeth and Julia. Uh, and the picture in the um, newspaper shows Julia uh, unveiling a new headstone over Elizabeth. And if you go on to the next slide, uh, um, Elizabeth there. Mm -hmm. Before Julia died, she did an interview with Ita Mallon of the Evening Herald in 1972. And it's a very revealing interview. Uh, in the way um, the journalist talks about Julia and Elizabeth. And as she said, she, Julia, was 83 then, living alone in the flat in Lower Man Street, the flat she had shared with Elizabeth all those years, which she and her Lizzie had shared for over half a century. The flat had become for Julia both a home and a shrine, not a marble place of mourning, though mentions of Nurse O'Farrell brought ready tears, but a place where she could relive memory, uh, the memory of all they had done together, the good times and the bad, the tours and our days in Rome, and of course, the rising. So again, here you have that um, partnership, that intense association between Elizabeth and Julia. And this is more than just a friendship. This is two people, the recognition of a partnership between two people. They're, they were each other's significant other. And if you go on to the next slide. And so then when Elizabeth dies, uh, they are buried together in Glasnevin Cemetery, as was planned when Julia brought the plot beside the Republican plot, and there they remain to this day. Um, and down at the end it says, and her faithful comrade and lifelong friend, Sheila Julia Grennan. So the, the um, after death, I suppose, of Julia and Elizabeth shows the intensity of their relationship, shows that intimate connection between them. And I would say that, that this sort of proof to me uh, indicates, and I would analyze this relationship as a significant relationship between two women, as a queer relationship between two women. Next slide, please. The next women I want to talk about are the ones I mentioned in the beginning, Kathleen Lynn and Madeleine French Mullen. Uh, and Kathleen and Madeleine uh, were uh, met, as I said, in the um, lockout in 1913. Um, Kathleen Lynn had trained as a doctor, um, 
was a doctor, was was the chief surgeon or the chief medical officer for the Irish Citizen Army, cha- trained all the women and the Gumman Amon women in first aid for the 1916 Rising. Again, would have been uh, active during the War of Independence and during the Civil War. St. Madeline was also, um, um, both of them remained active in politics in the Irish Free State. Uh, They set up St. Dalton's Hospital for Sick Infants. They brought Maria Montessori to Ireland. They were very, very much uh, concerned with social policies, although they had been anti-treaty and had rejected the legitimacy of the Irish Free State. Kathleen actually did become a TD, although she didn't take her seat because of the oath of allegiance. But going back to their relationship, both of them leave diaries, and in those diaries we can uh, get more than, uh, uh, you know, just hints of their relationship. Madeline, for example, talks about the fact that when they were imprisoned in Kilmainham Jail, she didn't know where Kathleen Lynn was, because they both fought in different places in 1916, Kathleen Lynn in City Hall and Madeline French Mullen in the Royal College of Surgeons. So they were arrested separately and they didn't know, Madeline said uh, she was in a cell with Countess Markovic. Uh, they didn't know whether the doctor was dead or alive. And then she said on May the 1st, uh, while she's still in Kilmainham, what a night of news. She told me how this is a woman she'd met. She and some dozen others were all week in Ship Street barracks with Dr. Lynn, who had been moved with them to Kilmainham that evening. Asked the matron if we might not exchange Bessie for Dr. Lynn, and she said yes in the morning. Bessie, being one of the Countess's camp followers, was quite uh, content to be exchanged. Thought the morning would never come. We heard various stories about the doctor, that she'd been arrested, missing, and the Countess and I feared we would not see her again. And then the very next day, she says, met the doctor going for water, had her to breakfast, hip hip. Uh, May the 4th, she talks about hearing the volleys of shot as three more of our men are shot in cold blood, though they were honourable prisoners of war. The doctor and I settled down to life and agreed that as long as we were left together, prison was somewhat bearable. And actually they weren't. Um, Kathleen Lynn was was deported to England under the Dora regulations and Madeline was taken to Mountjoy Jail, where she wrote in her diary that she, even then, Mountjoy was was much more comfortable than King Maynham Jail. She would give anything for uh, Dr. Lynn and Kilmainham. Kathleen Lynn also leaves a diary. She wrote uh, every day from 1916 until she died in the 1950s. Her diary runs to over 900,000 words, and it's an, an amazing social, cultural, political, medical history and gender history of Ireland. But it's also a history of a relationship of two women who lived together in the same house, who slept in the same bedroom, who worked together in the same hospital uh, and their daily life together. They were also lovers of the outdoors and they had a cottage in Glen Bluer in County Wicklow. Uh, And Kathleen Lynn's diary described their holidays up there about getting up very late and bathing in the river and then getting back into bed to warm up. Um, When Madeline died, Madeline died first. Uh, The entry in the diary was about loneliness and coming home in empty house and describing the loss, that sense of loss. Uh, Madeline and Kathleen are not there together. They are, um, um, Madeline French Mullen is in Glasnevin and Kathleen Lynn is in Mount Jerome. Uh, but their diaries indicate uh, the intensity of a relationship. And as Roy Foster said, it had all the ha- hallmarks of a, ma- of a marriage. Uh, if we go on to the next one, slide please. Oh, sorry, that's Madeline, next one. Mm-hmm. And again, I, I forgot to put up the Don't Kathleen Lynn Margaret. diaries. Yes. Margaret Skinner. And this is the woman I wrote a biography of recently. And, and when I started writing a biography of Margaret, I had some inclination uh, that she, she may have had relationships with women. And if you go on to the next slide, it, it, it'll give you an indication to why I thought that in the beginning. Mm-hmm. This is Margaret Skinner in 1915. She was very, very proud of the fact that she could dress up as a Fianna boy and pass as a Fianna boy. And the photograph on the left, as you're looking at the screen, is the photo that appeared in her 1917 memoir, Doing My Bit for Ireland. The photo on the right is the one uh, that has been recently discovered of the original of that photo. And you can see that she was very uh, happily 
uh, linking arms with two young women there. Margaret was born in Glasgow of Irish descent. Her, her father was from County Monaghan and her mother would have been first generation from County Meath. Uh, she grew up there very much influenced by the Gaelic League, by all the Irish diaspora over there. She would have uh, heard uh, talks by Connolly, uh, Markovich and others, and she drifted into militant suffrage activism and then into militant nationalism. She joined the Anne Devlin Common Amon branch in uh, Glasgow in 1915. She visited Ireland in late 1915 at the invitation of Countess Markovich, and there she meets with Connolly, with McDermott, uh, uh, Markovic, of course, whom she stays with, uh, and she's very much integrated into that leadership cohort, particularly of the Irish Citizen Army. She fight, She comes back in Easter 1916 and fights in the, in the Easter Rising with the Irish Citizen Army. She's one of the few women we know uh, had a militant role. She'd actually um, trained in a rifle club, uh, the rifle clubs that were set up in, in Britain, uh, at the outbreak of war in 1914 in case the Germans invaded, so women were being trained uh, in case they had to defend themselves. But Margaret said she took the opportunity to learn how to shoot, not for the defence of Britain, but for the defence of another country, obviously Ireland. And she was a crack shot. And she used that ability to fight. Uh, she was a sniper from the roof of the Royal College of Surgeons. She led an action against a sniper nest um, with two other, three other men from the Irish Citizen Army. Michael Mallon, her commandant, did not want to send her out as a woman, but she said to him, uh, having he heard the proclamation of 1916 and its promise of full and equal citizenship for women, that she was on, women were now on an equality with the men and therefore she could lead any action as well as any men. Unfortunately, she was wounded three times uh, in that action and almost died and was operated on by the uh, first aid women who had been trained by Kathleen Lynn and who were under the command of Madeleine French Mullen in the College of Surgeons. So all these women knew each other. Um, she survived. She went off to America at the end of 1916 with her best friend Nora Connolly, uh, daughter of James, and they spent the next 18 months going uh, around America with the Republican women, giving talks, uh, and it is there that she met Nora O'Keefe. Nora O'Keefe was from Tipperary, a, a Fenian family. Uh, she'd immigrated to New York with her brother in nine, around 1909, very much involved in the Gaelic League over there and all things uh, among the Irish diaspora, particularly the, the, those who were involved in Irish nationalism. Uh, Margaret and Nora are back in Dublin together in 1919, and they live together in Clontarf um, throughout their lives uh, for, until Nora dies in the 1950s, and then Margaret dies in the 1970s. Um, when I was writing the uh, biography of Margaret, I, there were no archives, although I found, found a lot of letters from Margaret and She Skeffington in the She Skeffington archive. And then, having discovered Nora's name, found a lot of letters from Nora to Hannah describing their life together. So you can see from those letters that Margaret and Nora are a couple. Hannah treats them as a couple. Nora Connolly O'Brien, who's also writing to Hannah Shea Skeffington, talks about uh, Margaret and Nora as a couple. And then I met her grandniece, who had this wonderful photographic archive of Margaret's life. Obviously, Margaret had a camera and they took a lot of photographs. And these are three images she shared with me from, from left to right. You have Margaret, uh, Nora is the woman in the white, Margaret is in the middle. That would have been in the 1920s, the 19, late, late 1930s, and then the last one would have been in the early 1950s before Nora died. So you can see here, uh, decades of uh, a life in ages, a life spent together, and there are dozens and dozens more uh, of their holidays together, of them visiting uh, the O'Keefe family down in Tipperary, of going to Glasgow to visit the Skinner family, and then the, the I suppose, um, thing that really made me understand that this was a life uh, of two women who were each other's significant other, who were a couple, is that when Margaret died, her executor, her nephew, um, burnt her diaries. Uh, she had apparently kept a diary all of her life. And he said he burnt her diaries because he did not want her private life to make it into the history books. So Margaret Skinner and Nora O'Keefe are a couple. 
they're not buried together. And when, Mar when Nora died first, Margaret's not mentioned in the obituary. But every year on the anniversary of Nora's death, uh, a memorial uh, notice appears in the newspapers that says in, uh, on the anniversary of her death, a mass will be said in honour of uh, for the repose of the soul of Nora O'Keefe uh, and other um, a few other sentences, and then just signed simply Margaret. So every year on the anniversary, Margaret put that in to remember Nora. These images for me demonstrate a life lived together, a life raising dogs, a life, um, uh, they were very much into the Irish wolf fans. If you look at newspaper reports of coming among funerals of their own comrades, it's always Margaret Skinner and Nora O'Keefe are mentioned. Um, they were activists together, they campaigned against the 1937 constitution together. Margaret had become a teacher. She was in the INTO, the Irish National Teachers Organization, and becomes its president in 1956. Um, and she dies then in 1972, has, having spent her life with Nora, uh, both of them as activists. Next one, please. And this brings in the Irish American, the Irish American um, connection. Uh, with Kathleen O'Brennan and Mar Marie Equi. Uh, Kathleen O'Brennan was born uh, in Dublin, uh, one of the uh, O'Brennan sisters. Uh, of course, her more famous sister would have been Anya Kant or Anya O'Brennan, who married Eamon Kant, one of the signatories of the proclamation. And her other sister was Lily O'Brennan, uh, a playwright and a writer. O'Brennan and Kathleen went to uh, America around um, 1915. Uh, so she's absent from Dublin when the rising happens, but it didn't prevent her from working hard in America to ensure Ireland's successful bid for independence. According to historian Catherine M. Burns, O'Brennan arrived in, in America before the rising and stayed there until the early 1920s. She worked as a journalist and lecturer and traveled to California and Oregon and took the opportunity to present herself to a women's organization as an authority on the Gaelic League and Irish art and culture. Uh, her lectures include details she got from her sisters uh, about the rising. While she was on the West Coast, she became involved with the Industrial Workers of the World, or the Wobblies, and this brought her to the attention of the American authorities, of course. Uh, and when she became involved with the Wobblies, she, um, uh, through Dr. Mary Equi, uh, it was obvious that they were having a relationship together, and indeed there is an FBI file on them and their deviant relationship. When Mary Equi was arrested, O'Brennan worked to get her released, and of course Mary Equi as well is uh, of Irish descent. Her mother was from County Tyrone. Uh, and Mary Equi is very much involved in the Irish nationalist cause as well and would, was a good friend of Hannah Shee Skeffington's, who also knew Kathleen O'Brennan. So again, you see all these connections, all these women knew each other. Each other. Kathleen stayed in um, America for until the early 1920s, as I said. She was very much involved with the American women picketing uh, venues where um, um, demanding US recognition for the Irish Republic. Um, she would have worked along with Gertrude Kelly, who was the founder of the Common Amman in New York. And of course, Gertrude Kelly, born in Waterford, but immigrated as a young child to America, also spent her life uh, with another woman, with Mary Walsh. So again, all of the actions show that there were activist women who made these choices and who knew, who all knew each other. And again, how I found this is that there are um, letters in the O'Brennan um, archives here in, in uh, the National Library uh, that contain letters from Mary Equi uh, about Kathleen O'Brennan, but also letters in the Hannah Shee's Geffington archive where uh, Equi is writing to Hannah and asking for O'Brennan uh, after uh, O'Brennan has come home. Uh, they did not obviously remain in a relationship together. It was a brief um, interlude that they had. Uh, and there's no um, evidence that Kathleen O'Brennan was involved in anyone once she, with anyone once she comes back to Ireland. Um, the next slide, please. Mm -hmm. And the last one I'm going to talk about is Helena Maloney. Helena Maloney is quite famous for being involved in Nina the Heron with Maud Gaughan, involved in the Irish Women Workers' Union, involved in Cumann and Mon, fought in the 1916 Rising with the Irish Citizen Army, 
uh, like uh, many radical women, her politics took a left-wing trajectory and she was involved in trade union activism, worked in the Liberty Hall during the lockout. She is the one who brought both Kathleen Lynn and Countess Markovich into socialist and militant organizations. So again, you see the connections. So she knew Lynn, she knew French Mullen, she knew Markovich. She would have known Margaret Skinner because they, they would have fought in the Irish Citizen Army together. Um, Mary, I suppose Selena Maloney we could look at more as bi in that she was involved with a relationship with Sean Connolly who was shot and dead in 1916 and it's towards the end of her life when um, she meets with her partner that she spent 20 years with, Dr Evelyn O'Brien. Helena had a hard life after the rising. Uh, many of these women had PTSD because of the traumas they faced and, and the, the bloodshed they saw. Uh, and Helena's uh, PTSD manifested itself with um, abuse of alcohol. She was a brilliant Abbey actress, but unfortunately the alcohol uh, put pay to that. And she was in and out of psychiatric care for a long time. Um, <clears throat> she really only began to get her life back together once she met psychiatrist Dr. Evelyn O'Brien, with whom she lived until her death from the mid 1940s in, until her death in 1967. And as uh, Maloney's biographer says, her later years with Evelyn O'Brien gave her peace and solace she began to be feted as one of the great survivors of the rising, albeit with large bits of her legacy suppressed. She died in 1967. And next slide, please. So there are many other couples I could talk about with you. Um, Margaret Trench and Judy Witter, Mar Margot Trench, again, a family of uh, women who were involved in Gaelic nationalism. There are love letters between Margot and Judy uh, in the Trench uh, family archives in the National Library. The most famous, of course, are Eva Gore Booth and Esther Roper. Eva Gore Booth was the sister of Countess Markievicz, gave up her life, like Markievicz, of, of luxury uh, to live in Manchester with Esther Roper, both of them trade union activists, suffrage activists, pacifists. They were editors of a magazine called Urania, which discussed how, um, you know, we should get rid of gender. Uh, they were very interested in trans issues, uh, which is extraordinary, 100 years before uh, trans rights activism has become mainstream in the 21st century. As I mentioned, Gertrude Kelly, born in Ireland and founder of Common Amman. And then Ella Young. Ella Young was um, uh, the, held the chair in uh, Celtic literature in the University of California, Berkeley, for over a decade. But prior to going there, she was involved in the Easter Rising, was a good friend of Maud Gons, very much involved in theosophy, uh, the spiritualist movement that both Yeats and Gon and many of the others of uh, Celtic nationalism were involved in. And theosophy, of course, allowed a lot of these people to be very radical in their expression of sex and sexuality, because with um, reincarnation, you came back as a man or a woman. Um, and therefore, it didn't really matter who you were involved in, uh, in relationships in, in whatever life you were living at that time. Ella Young, uh, main relationship seems to have been with a young woman who's only known by a pseudonym and with the mystic Alice Boyd. Um, and she wrote um, a biography uh, called The Flowering Dusk, in which she talks all about these, uh, these couples. We do know that Ella Young knew Kathleen O'Brennan um, and was very much involved in the, uh, I suppose, American circles of radical uh, artists, um, mystics, theosophists. Uh, she knew um, many of those. She knew the, the uh, nephew of... Uh, President Arthur, Gavin Arthur, who was very much involved in that whole area as well. Um, and she was um, uh, very much uh, connected with fairy lore and Celtic uh, mysticism and Celtic literature um, and spent her life, um, the rest of her life in California. She was also a, bit, a big advocate of protecting the native redwoods of California. So to, come to, to conclude, I suppose, um, what I'm saying about these uh, women is as we 
uh, in 2016, we had all the national and local commemorations of the rising. We had the army deliver the tricolor to the school in every country with a spectacular march down O'Connell Street. We had many places named after the signatures of the rising, after women in Cumann Amman. We even had a bridge over the Liffey named after a young working class uh, trade unionist, Rosie Hackett. All along, uh, we had the people of Ireland looking at the document that was central to the proclamation, the 1916 Rising, and re realizing that it was this promise of full and equal citizenship. It was a radical document for a radical generation. But these, some histories were still silent, some were still invisible. And I think it's these histories that we need to continue to excavate and write back into the history, into the history books. The question is, were there same-sex couples prominent in over socialist trade union and Republican circles whose sexuality has remained largely hidden? I think from giving you the names of these women, um, the answer is yes. Women who lived in the same house and slept in the same bed for 30 years often had their uh, lesbianism strongly denied. However, archival and interview materials that we have used have shown that these women did have same-sex relationships and that we have to recognize that. I would argue that their private lives, integral as they are to the motivations for their public actions or their radical actions, um, cannot remain excluded from our history. Social and political history needs to include the study of marginalized groups and these twice marginal, twice invisible status of queer women in Ireland needs to be seriously redressed. My research has uncovered a number of these relationships and I suggest to you that we have in this revolutionary period a rich existing history of same-sex relationships among political and radical women. And indeed, when we look for it, the history already exists in the archives and public documents, in material culture, and in artifacts. The absence of these histories and concerns from our narratives is a powerful way of ensuring the women continued, especially queer women, continue to be deprived of a rich and satisfying history. And that, it, that this can be part of an exclusion and marginalization generally of LGBT people in society. My research and that of others, I hope, go some ways to provide a corrective to that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, I think that was brilliant. Um, Mary, I'm trying to read all the comments on Facebook as well. You know, I absolutely, mm -hmm. of course, totally agree with you. That I saw somebody said Kathleen Yen is, is buried in Dean's Grange, not Matt Jerome. I couldn't remember one. Oh there yeah. Moment it is Dean's <laughs> I didn't even check in the chat here because I was sharing my screen. Um, I mean, when you think about, so one of the questions that came up on Facebook was, you know, how did the Roman Catholic Church uh, deal with that? And, and kind of a colloquy, I suppose, of that. Um, it's interesting how many of these women who initially are anti-treaty, you know, because I, I suppose it didn't go far enough in their view to justify the sacrifice yeah. kind of, but then look at how few of them are served by de Valera in his vision of Ireland. And, you know, so that, that quote that you put up in the last slide, you know, look at how we treated single women, particularly unmarried mothers. And so those women must have felt, yeah. you know, as you said, doubly isolated and, and kind of betrayed in a way, I suppose, by, you know, presumably the likes of de Valera knew that some of these women were in same sex marriages or at least knew that they were friends, you know. So would you like to kind of comment on I, that? It's, it's hard to know because I think women were very, like unlike men who were criminalized at that time, women yeah. weren't yeah. for same sex relationship. And they were able to pass because, you know, if a woman didn't get married and she shared her home with another woman, they were seen as being company for one another. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so they were able to hide their relationships a lot. Now, it's obvious that they're women friends, both straight and gay, uh, if we can use those modern terms, um, knew of the relationships and accepted them. And we mm -hmm. do know that there was an underground culture. When I gave this lecture um, uh, once, a woman came up to me and she said, she, in her family, there's a story of her granduncle, I think, playing at a piano club or a supper club once a month on Leeson Street, where all these, where women met and danced with each other and hung out together. So we know there was um, an underground, um, small though it may have been, social life out there, mm -hmm. certainly in the early 1920s. In 1920s Ireland, which was, you know, 
developing and, and flowering into being uh, the Magdalene laundries and the mother and baby homes and really co coercing and controlling what it meant to be a respectable Irish woman, which was marriage, motherhood and domesticity. Mm -hmm. uh, and all of them campaigned against the 1937 Constitution, Kathleen Lynn, Madeleine Frenchmullen, Skinner Doyle O'Keefe, Hannah Sheaf Geffington, all of that group of women who all knew each other, those who were in straight relationships and those who were not, all, were, were all uh, comrades together. And they'd all been through real experiences together. And I suppose they just accepted each other as they were. But I think for the outside world, they didn't see that. Although, mm -hmm. interestingly, um, in a documentary about Kathleen Lynn, uh, a woman, she was, I think, 100. She was from Ackle. When she was interviewed, she was like, you're 98 or 100, because mm -hmm. uh, she was still alive and she'd worked there in the 1920s and 30s. Um, talked about the fact, and she didn't say it out, but she talked about the fact that you never saw one without the other. Right. Never, ever, that they were together, that they were a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what it's very. Sort of I'm just looking at the the other. So there was one or two comments in here. Um, just that you, they're amazed at the involvement in all the progressive movements, and I suppose it is not surprising. I suppose particularly women who might have been conscious of their own outsiderness, you know, as as gay women maybe or or bi, whichever the case may be, that you know that there was intersection between socialism you know and suffrage and nationalism that of course they would be interested in kind of more than one you know movement um so Jeffrey yeah, just I made think that point. sometimes mm -hmm. you have to, to to ask whether it's the chicken or chicken or egg which came yeah. first their own realization of their own feelings or the the involvement in radical politics allowed them to make radical choices that perhaps yeah. they couldn't have made were they not involved in progressive movements? Yeah. Um, and maybe they felt that anyway, but it would have had to have remained hidden uh, mm -hmm. and suppressed. Mm -hmm. um, but being involved in radical movements, because of course the, the, the heterosexual people were also being quite radical in terms of their sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, many of them were having affairs, many of them were choosing who they were married themselves. There was cross-class marriages, there were uh, in, um, inter-religious marriages mm -hmm. going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so this was happening among that radical, um, youthful, generational um, group of, of uh, militant suffrage women and men and uh, revolutionary women and men, as well as among the, the women themselves. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, let me just see, was there another one? Oh, yeah. So you saw that comment. Um, Someone has said on here, but I think it is a novel. Do you know that work, Albert Nobbs? Um, actually, it might have been a play. I, I don't think that's based on yeah, anyone yeah. in particular, is it? No, no, I don't think so. Yeah. But no, no, I think it is just a, as well. Yeah, it, it's a play, yeah. I think, first, and then, yeah, work of fiction. So that was just in here. Um, so it's interesting oh. about the families, too. You know, I, I, I had heard a story that, you know, oh, my great aunt lived with the woman, you know, with force with someone for years. And there was this kind of nod and a wink, like, you know, we thought they might be together, but we were never sure. And, you know, so maybe families, I think you kind of covered it, that women were able to sort of cover it because wasn't it nice for them to have company for each other, you know, kind of thing. And, and so there was never, it well, wasn't yes, assumed also, that they were together. There is the discomfort, like Margaret Skinner's yeah. nephew destroying her papers. I yeah. cry. I almost cried when I heard that because imagine having that diary. I know. Um, not just for the, the the relationship, but also Margaret Skinner was involved in almost every social movement. In and she died in 1972, so like that would have been the first five six decades of the Irish Free State mm -hmm. and the Irish Republic. So that would have given us such insight. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I do know there there seems to have been tension, say, with the the Lynn family. When you read Kathleen Lynn's diaries, um, the Madeleine, the French Mullen family, they're they're always meeting them for tea and they're hanging out with them and doing all that sort of thing with uh, both of them, Madeleine and Kathleen. But with the Lynn family, only Kathleen goes to visit. So, okay. you know, there possibly was tension there. And there also was tension, say, with Helena Maloney and her relationship with Evelyn O'Brien. O'Brien was much younger than her and O'Brien's family were not very happy with that relationship at all.
Mm. But, uh, so, it's, a, it's you, an amazing one to kind of think about. There are changes Well, and as you, you mentioned, Roger, placement, you know, that people do still think, oh, should the diary was a forgery or, you know, a deliberate slander yeah, yeah, attempt, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah. Um, does anyone here on Zoom less or? Less, I think more and more people are accepting of these histories. Yeah. Uh, when I started talking about this first, I thought, well, people won't really like the fact that, you know, the heroes of 1916 may have been anything but, you know, straight. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But actually, no, people are fascinated and very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, I'm very interested in this and, and really want to know more uh, mm -hmm. because I think it's and it's the same with the gendered and sexual violence you know they want to know these histories mm -hmm. they don't want that mainstream history that we've been fed for generations mm -hmm. to continue we need to um, um, understand this sort of more nuanced more complicated broader history that mm -hmm. brings in so many aspects of what are our lives today you know, uh, well, exactly it, not yeah. just in the 1970s in mm -hmm. Ireland, mm -hmm. although we might think it. Yeah, no, I think that's exactly um, right. It gives it a much richer kind of a viewpoint. And it also, I suppose, you know, the sorrow is the contrast of what could have been, like, you know, how genuinely progressive that document was in 1916 and the 1918 democratic program, and then it doesn't happen. And, you know, so to think that these people genuinely were you know, much more diverse than we've been led to maybe believe, I, you know, I, I think it's kind of uplifting, to be honest. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Uh, so and someone has said, you, you you sorry, go ahead, Mary. Igor Booth and Esther's relationship yeah. were more open, was most, yeah, it was, of course. Um, they were buried under a quotation. They're buried in the same grave under a quotation from Sappho, so you can't really deny them that. But their <laughs> yeah. first biographer, uh, Gifford Lewis, um, went out her way to deny their relationship. And in fact, in letters, Sonia Tiernan, the biographer of Eva Gore Booth, has written about the fact that uh, Gifford Lewis sent letters to Jocelyn Gore Booth, the last Gore Booth who lived in Lissadale, mm -hmm. and this would have been in the 1980s, that she had found no evidence of deviancy, mm, deviancy. in their relationship. Yeah. Deviant, and she used that deviancy. But mm. obviously, uh, Sonia has done a, a, an amazing job of... of Re resurrecting their relationship in her biography of, of Eva Gore Booth. Um, so, yes. Okay. And then someone said, you mentioned one woman was involved in what became, you know, trans rights. What did the fight trans for rights. trans rights? So you were saying like it was almost, you know, uh, anachronistic sort of thing. I forget which woman yes, that was. Yes, that was Eva Gore, Eva Gore Booth and Esther Roper again. They had a magazine called Urania. Uh, and they talked a lot about identity, about gender. They they wanted, they thought the world would be better off without genders. We just have one gender. We just all be one gender. Although the gender they suggested seemed very feminine. Um, <laughs> they were very interested in how you can transform your identity. And they reported a lot in, in Urania about the first, the early medical, medical um, procedures for uh, for trans people, um, mm -hmm. and so uh, I, I, if I recall, there was one that happened in Japan, and they reported from Germany. And of course, in the 1920s, uh, in the Weimar Republic in Germany, there was an explosion of um, counterculture um, and and sexology. And they were very much involved in the, with the sexologists and and understanding uh, that broader um, take on sexuality. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, Urania is a very interesting magazine mm -hmm. that it's almost like included aspects of queer theory and performativity before we had that language mm -hmm. to, to talk about that. Um, and it was this the subscribers list is very interesting to look at as well. A lot of the women's colleges subscribed and, and suffrage organizations. So, you know, these people were reading about um different ways of being in the world 100 years ago I think we forget that that they were quite radical in their thinking mm -hmm. because of course the backlash in Ireland for example comes then with the free state which yeah. shuts down any sort of radicalism and yeah, becomes yeah. a well, then, highly conservative yeah look at the, the really. 1937 constitution you know sure that was a massive betrayal to these women really you know 
Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they all fought against it. I think that was yeah. the, the last big fight. A lot of them took together uh, yeah. was against the women in the home art, which are still in the Constitution. Yeah. Isn't that amazing? I, I must I mentioned it, something mm -hmm. recently and I couldn't believe that it hadn't been repealed. Like I knew there had been this movement around repealing it. And then, you know, it just kind of seemed to have died in around 2018 or something. So. Yeah, it, it is sort of shocking. Well, there's a citizens' assembly going on at the moment, and hopefully they will suggest either yeah. repealing it or changing it into a gender neutral yeah. article on care, care in yeah. the community. Yeah. Uh, so someone asks, I know Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas were older, but did you find evidence that they knew any of these women? And great presentation, thank you. They knew a lot. The um, Natalie Barney and her cohort in Paris. Um, certainly, um, uh, and Dolly Wilde, of course, was part of that, or um, Oscar Wilde's niece, Dolly, um, mm -hmm. was very much involved in that. Um, and they, uh, Kathleen O'Brien certainly would have known of that because she knew Gavin Arthur, who was very much involved in that, whose wife, Esther Murphy, was Estelle Murphy, was very much involved in that um, cohort in Paris. Murphy, of course, also having Irish American connections mm -hmm. or Irish connections. She was Irish American. Um, so, yes, they would have known of those people. Um, and again, when you because, of course, the, these are mainly middle class and wealthier women I'm talking about, they were um, they moved around the world differently than working class women. And this is the problem with doing this research. Um, these are radical middle class uh, educated women who leave stuff behind for the historian to find. Um, Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan were working class, but because they'd been so active, there is material about them. Mm -hmm. Finding working class female couples or indeed male couples is impossible because they leave nothing in the record. So mm -hmm. there's probably a whole cohort mm -hmm. uh, of people out there that, again, we will never find because mm -hmm. there is nothing. They leave nothing in the yeah. records. Or, you know, the rural element too, I'm thinking, you know, sure would have been completely silent. Um, someone says here, well, my history is, oh, go ahead, Mary, sorry. Yeah. It's interesting for both of us are from North Kerry. Yeah. Um, uh, a few years ago, I was doing a little bit of research on the Arachalis uh, mm. for uh, both the Arachali himself, who died in 1916, and his sisters, Anna and Nell, who were involved in coming a man. I was just looking into the family and the founder of the fortune of the Arahali seems to have been an aunt who um, is buried in Liz Lockton with her housekeeper. They seem to have run the whole business together and they're buried in, as far as I know, the same grave together. And wow. again, this always gets my antennae up and I wonder about that. Um, so, yeah. Because mm. across the class too, you know, that's you amazing. Yeah. It does, yeah. yeah. So someone asked my Irish history is serious slacking here. My apologies. What's the significance of the 1937 constitution and why was there a backlash? So do you just want to explain about that article really quickly, Mary? Okay. <laughs> um, the 37 constitution replaced the 1922 constitution, which is just a very short one. It said, you know, reach the age of 18 or 21, you vote, um, equality between the sexes, that was it. In the 37 constitution, there is articles 42.1 and 42.2, which said a woman by her life in the home gives to the nation a common good without which the nation can't do. I'm paraphrasing here. And then the next, next article says, and mothers, so interchange wife and woman and mother, because all women will be mothers, mother by her life um, should not by economic necessity be forced to work outside the home to the neglect of her duties in the home. So that's in the constitution. Basically women, Irish women, should be in the home being mothers and mothers within marriage, because we know that the model of family is a marital family by the articles that come after that. So marriage, motherhood and domesticity are written into the constitution for women. And there's been a backlash against that. It went against 1916, which was the proclamation that promised mm -hmm. full and equal citizenship for women. Mm -hmm. And like, I think some- and that's why all the families fought against it. Yeah. 
So they, they fought very hard in 1936 or 37 to, to like not have that wording in there. And, and, you know, people today kind of argue that mothers or families get social welfare payments, you know, for children. And that maybe that if that language was taken out, that the state's responsibility for supporting a family would kind of be negated. But, you know, it seems a bit, as you said, if they change the language to care or like instead of mother, you know, it would be better for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. It would be better for everyone. And anyway, yeah. that, that those articles in the Constitution have never, like women have never been financially underpinned to actually stay at home yeah. and be mothers if they yeah. wanted to be. Um, they well, sure, you had to give up your job when you married um, and all, you know. Mm-hmm. Yes, the marriage bar existed till the early 1970s, yeah. yeah. So, so I think... Yeah, it needs I don't to come think- out. Yeah, God, I hope it does. You know, it is like as a single woman myself and child free, you know, you feel a bit left out. <laughs> sort of, you know. um, there are no other questions on Facebook. Does anyone here on Zoom have any, a question or uh, anything there? People are thanking you. This is fantastic. You've never heard, you know, things like it before. I do think it, it shows you how inclusive, you know, Irish society. Uh, thanks, Bob. Another great program you know could have been and that you know I, I think anyone that's being added to a story uh, as your work is doing you know Mary to unearth these stories that are kind of half hidden and, and and veiled of course makes it more you know we can see ourselves reflected in in that world 100 years ago but we can see too you know mm-hmm. that it wasn't just rich white cis straight people you know who, who were doing this it was a, yeah. a wide variety and that there was mm-hmm our lives you know or all lives were reflected in in the movement so i think that's great um mm-hmm. i think it also reflects um modern our society today because of course yeah. um you know the decade of centenaries has opened up women's history has opened up labor history class history and now these histories as well and i'm not the only one doing this uh, morris casey in epic gave a fabulous lecture uh, last week about kathleen o'brennan Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Yeah. Um, as well, you know, so, you know, a lot of people are getting really interested in, in this and it, it, it reflects that broad, that opening up of Irish society that has happened in yeah. the last decade or so, like with marriage equality in 2015 mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So the while these the first, histories yeah. have always been there, now is the time that people are writing them and interested in them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think it's great. So um, I apologize for your late night, but, you know, thank you so much. And um, we'll have you back. Uh, We should have scheduled it for last week. There would have only been four hours between us. (laughs) But I wasn't thinking about the cocks, I have to say. Um, So I'm looking forward to seeing you when I get home at some point. And um, everyone, thanks you. And uh, we'll definitely have you back, you know. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mary McCall. Thank you all from UCD, my own alma mater, and um, a, a Kerry woman. So <laughs> we're thrilled with that as well. <laughs> and from North Kerry, yes. <laughs> exactly, exactly, the cultural capital. <laughs> so yeah. thank you very much, everyone. Have a thank great you, night. You. Thanks, not at all. Thank you, Jack. We're back on Wednesday with our genealogist to do a kind of a, you know, help you sort out your family tree. And if anyone has any, you know, kind of beginner questions or advanced questions, Lisa will do an open session on Zoom and Facebook. And I'm just finishing the April newsletter now. So our first um, activity that we have in April is between Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Thursday and Easter Monday, we're sharing Fishamble Theatre Company in Dublin. Um, They did Inside the GPO. It's a kind of a play about this, what we've just talked about. So we'll have a lot of Easter 1916 commemorations in April. And we have a couple of other talks. So you'll get your newsletter hopefully tomorrow, but it could be the day after. So thanks everyone, and I really appreciate it. And we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Good night, Dr. McCullough. Thank you very much. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye.